go ahead and start. Okay, welcome everyone. Uh, it says welcome HOSA advisors, but obviously we have a lot of competitors here as well, and you're very welcome. Uh, just a little warning, it might be a little advisor centric because that's how we were planning it at first. So uh, stay as long as you wish to. It's still going to be very interesting for everyone, I think. Uh, my name is Abby Brockhouse, and I am a high school teacher. I teach science, biotechnology, AP chemistry, honors chemistry, and I have taught biology and physics. And I'm here at Scott Catholic High School in Omaha, Nebraska, and I'm also a COSA, uh, a COSA, a HOSA co-advisor with uh, Amanda Wilms here at Scott. And so I know, I, I feel like I'm kind of in the middle of the pack because there's a huge variety of backgrounds with HOSA advisors. We have a super advisor in Nebraska who does a great job and she just kind of stepped up and, and said, yes, I'll do it because there was a need and she's an English teacher. And so a science is not, is not required. And then of course, on the other spectrum, there are all these CTEs and the health uh, academies that are a little bit more intimidating to me because that's not our focus. We are a traditional high school. So uh, I'm hoping to be able to, if you're, if you're no more than me, please correct me. And um, if you have questions, those are always very, very welcome. Okay, so this new event is so exciting. It is um, all about the science behind the medicine. The, everyone has been hearing about all of these new developments, especially in the last few years, but even before that. And everyone is excited about that. And our kids are especially. And so um, there's all sorts of technology that goes with that medical research and uh, diagnostics, vaccines, therapeutics, you name it, some and new ones coming out all the time. So that is why this event is such a good idea for OSA. So uh, it is particularly exciting for, for advisors uh, because if you are like me and you teach biotech and, and the sciences, I, I finally get to have um, a direct way to help my students prepare for HOSA, for competition. Uh, some of my kids do anatomy and physiology, at least there is a teacher who teaches that in the building, that's great. Um, but in this case, I'll actually be the teacher of, of an event and, and it will have a lot of crossover and even if you are not in that position, you can make connections with other teachers. A lot of what is being covered in this event is material that they would find in regular biology class and AP bio. And so a lot of the traditional science classes would have some of this content. And so there again, we can we can prepare them. I have it's, it's so refreshing for me. I have a young lady who does amazing on dental terminology and she does it all on her own because I have absolutely no, nothing to give her for a dental terminology. So uh, I'm excited to get a little more involved with uh, event preparation. And you may find going into this, you might get ideas for your classroom too. If you have to learn it for HOSA, you might as well use it in the class as well. The other reason it's so uh, is exciting is there's a ton of resources and backup and support. Uh, you have all the usual kind of host event support as far as rubrics and um, skill scenarios, practice scenarios, and uh, a list of uh, resources that are recommended. But in addition to that, Biorad has uh, support. Let me just go to the website and show you for just a sec. Incredible amount of support. Here we go. There's this site and you can contact a specialist uh, like um, Lee or, or Jamie. And I didn't give you a chance to introduce yourselves. 
So Lee is, is they are all, there's a whole team of people who are, are, are ready to help you. In addition, um, there's everything laid out and for advisors, this wonderful skills planning guide. And I'll give you a peek at that right here. Okay, and it gives you the skills, notes, skills and resources, what kind of materials you need for each skill, uh, what kind of preparation you might have to do. A lot of it is not a lot of preparation, which is good news because we're all very busy. Uh, what you might want to order, depending on how in depth. So it's all laid out and organized for you, which is huge. And uh, there is a textbook in all of the events, all of the skill events, uh, come from activities labs from this biotechnology textbook from Biorad. Uh, yeah. And Biorad um, also provides equipment, uh, so it's equipment and kits that are supportive of this event. And so there's not a lot of guesswork about what to get to prepare. So that's all about advisors. Students obviously are very excited about this event. I just did an in-person expo for this in Nebraska in November, and the kids were just, just crowding into the room and they wanted to get their hands on this. So they are super excited. Uh, everyone knows labs are the most fun part of school. And um, like I said, it relates to current events. Um, kind of dabbling and seeing if they would like this as a career or just just curiosity it's cutting edge and it's very fun so so what is this event it's a typical hosa event in that it's a two round event round one is a written test and then the top scoring competitors from the written test go on to round two which is a hands-on skill event there are eight skills, and you may have one or two of these, depending on how your SLC is uh, set up, how many events, there, how many skills they're going to test. So you could get any one or two of these uh, being using micropipettes and transfer pipettes, restriction digestion, DNA gel electrophoresis, DNA gel interpretation, Bradford protein assays, bacterial transformation, calculating your transformation efficiency, and an ELISA test. So that is what is. Okay, so again, tons of support. As usual, there are your competitive event guidelines like you have for every event. Um, and I'll just take a quick peek at that. You guys are used to seeing these. They're all set up in this nice organized fashion from HOSA, uh, reminding you what to bring and um, what kind of reference books are recommended. In addition, you've got the Biorad link and you've got some sample questions there. You've got this wonderful playlist where these skills are demonstrated. And so there is no um, mystery about what is this? What is, what is expected? What does this look like? I've never heard of this. Well, watch the video and see. Okay, and then of course there's the rubrics that we have for every event, clearly um, delineated for you. All right. Um, I showed you the Biorides uh, set our site already and the skills planning guide. So that's there. The textbook is just fabulous. And of course, there's curriculum training specialists, teacher fellows like me, and uh, supportive kits and equipment. And uh, probably some supportive teachers in your own building that use this sort of thing. Here's, uh, here's an overview of the skills events again. Here we go. And the video list. We're just very proud of the video list. It's very helpful. So I'm going to go over three different things. 
And the longest part is the first part. How can I help my students prepare? First thing I would say is get the textbook. It's about $99, I believe. And relative to some of those other textbooks that they uh, recommend for various disciplines, you know, medical things are, are not cheap. It's pretty reasonable. And, a, you know, it could be your only source and it would be uh, covering everything you need. A lot of the background information you need for the multiple choice questions, they would uh, be in this textbook. And at least um, if you wanna go further into it, obviously do that, but all of the subjects are there. All of the skills are labs that are already in that textbook. And so there's your resource for, for practicing and for planning. So uh, if you're just going to get one thing, because I know everybody's got a budget, I would get the textbook. The second um, thing that would be good to prepare is get that first skill down. The first skill is pipetting, micro pipetting. And it is a key skill for all the other skills. You really cannot do the ELISA or the protein assay or the gel electrophoresis or any of that. You cannot do it properly if you cannot uh, use a micro pipette properly. So get that down first. And then um, you want, don't want to just focus on, okay, I can do this. It's not just a, oh, I, you know, it's a skills event, but you also have to understand what you're doing and why you're doing it and the science behind it and the big picture. And so if you want to go, beyond um, just being able to physically do these skills, a good way to get the background and the, the why behind it is to delve into um, a kit. And um, you get an idea of the workflow in a real lab. What is the order of steps you would do? Why are you doing it this way? You'll get some real results to interpret. And so it'll be a lot more meaningful. And a lot of the kits will cover more than one skill. As we see here, forensics has three skills out of one uh, kit and the PBLO kit covers two. So um, there's also the curriculum specialists like Lee and Jamie and others, they can tell you about tips and tricks to get the most out of the kit because everybody's on a budget and um, you wanna really be able to get the most you can. They're typically set up for groups of, uh, or eight groups. And so that's a lot of practicing uh, that you can get out of them. And of course, you don't have to get the kits to practice the skills. So I don't want you to think that you have to but it, it's just another layer that would be helpful. You can also practice with colored water and, um, and get that extra practice in. Okay, so here's just an overview of skills that are supported by kits. The other thing to help your students to prepare is to show them something like this slide that um, not all the instruments look the same as what they would have in the classroom, okay? So I have, for my own pipettes, mine look like this. My students' pipettes look slightly different. They look like this. And other manufacturers have different looking pipettes, but they all work the same way and they all do the same job. So you don't want your students to kind of get into the, the competition and kind of get, oh, what is that? That's not what I'm used to. Well, in real labs all over the world, you'll see variations on the same tools that do the same job. And um, again, here's another example for gel electrophoresis. Our gel boxes look like this from Biorad, but there are all sorts of others as well. Okay.
Don't worry, I'm muted. They can't hear. So, um, again, refer to the skills as they're laid out in the host to competitive event guideline rubrics. And um, there is a time constraint. And so you'll see in the rubric, it's very clear that sometimes you'll have like an incubation time where it would normally be 20 minutes or 10 minutes or whatever it is, but you don't have that kind of time at competition. And so you would just verbalize, okay, then I wait 20 minutes and then you do the next step. Okay, so make sure to look at the competitive event. You know how those are always like, you know, the, your best friend going in, looking at the rubrics and knowing uh, what you need to do. The skills are um, meant to assess uh, your abilities and your decision-making around the skills. So understanding the background of why you're doing the steps you're doing and uh, how to best choose the right tool to, for the job. There'll be more tools there than you need necessarily. And you'll be it'll be up to you to understand which tool is best for the job and um, what the big picture is. And there is, it, it is, it might be a little um, frustrating. Anika Rommel, please come to our office. Anika Rommel. There is a um, time constraint, but it's on purpose because you know how it is with these, um, you're used to standardized tests and all sorts of things. Uh, if there was excess amount of time to do everything and you could have, you know, 50 people do the task perfectly, then how do you choose your your gold, silver, and bronze placing? So there is that little bit of pressure on you um, in order to, to make it more competitive. All right. Okay, so uh, again, I can't say this enough, Re refer to the rubric Okay, the judges have the rubric in front of them and that is how they are grading you. And so it's nice to know what's going on in their heads. It's, it's an advantage. Competitors should read through HOSA guidelines and understand materials or uh, which ones you're expected to bring. Okay, that's not big news. You have to do that for every event. Um, so, you know, whether it's a lab coat or gloves or a ruler or whatever you need, uh, make sure you have it. And you need to know um, from what you bring and from what's provided, what to use when, and that you may not use everything. You may, but you may not. Look at the sample scenario. That's always very helpful. And that's in the HOSA guidelines as well and look at the, the Biorad um, resources and the playlist for sure, and the skills planning guide. Oh, what did I do there? Sorry. Um, Not sure why this is happening. Hold on. Okay, slideshow, there we go. Little blip. There we go. All right. So the second part of this is what can students expect at the event? Well, we've we covered a lot of that in the first part. But uh, one thing to point out is you'll be given a scenario. You have a sample scenario in the HOSA guidelines to give you an idea of the script they might give you. It's obviously not going to be exactly the same. And, it, and that script happen to, happens to be for skill one. So if you're not being tested on skill one, it'll be different. But it'll give you an idea. And um, there are usually some kind of volumes to pipette, no matter what you're doing. And those will vary. And so you, there's no sense in memorizing volumes. What you would have to understand is the overall process and uh, what it is you're supposed to be achieving. Okay, so don't worry about memorizing volumes because they may well be different. All right. Um, here's um, how to organize competitive events at SLC. This is the first time we're 
having this. Uh, I'm organizing the event for Nebraska. So this is what I'm sitting down and thinking about. Um, first of all, chat with us if you need help choosing which events to host. Okay, because there's there's eight choices there. And the second thing that was on my mind was to find judges. So where to look? Uh, if you know teachers who are able to help you out, um, I'm also asking local college professors in the field to help me out and um, undergrads at college to help me out, grad students. And um, you can also go further field. Um, even uh, we have local labs that do agriculture and agricultural and medical testing and pharmaceutical labs. Um, you can ask people there. And if you're really not finding anyone, you could also ask your host estate uh, advisor. And you'd be surprised, um, or maybe you've already kind of discovered this, that when you reach out to colleges and to local industries, they are so enthusiastic about helping. And we have found this uh, doing our host nights and finding speakers and panelists they really want to have a relationship with the high school students. The colleges are looking at who's, you know, coming through the pipeline. And the industries also want students to be interested in what they do. They often also have an official outreach and, and they're looking for places to, to connect with the community. So it's usually pretty fruitful. Um, and then the other aspect is that you should probably meet with your judges uh, a little in advance to go over um, the rubric so that they're really clear about it and they're comfortable with their role. All right, micropipetting. This is the key skill to all the skills. And so we're gonna talk a little bit about it. It's needed for six out of the eight events. Okay. Which ones don't need it? Oh, which ones don't need it? Okay, so there is the calculation of transformation efficiency. That's a paper-based. And the um, looking at the gel, um, interpreting, or interpreting the gel, which I was going to go over at the end, uh, that is also... Uh, paper-based. Good question. All right. So again, there are videos to help you uh, with the pipetting. Okay. I think there's a hand up, maybe. Uh, yes, it's my hand. Okay. Uh, so for the ones that don't have videos, is there like extra resources? So, okay, the ones that doesn't have, yes there are extra resources. There is um, a resource for calculating transformation efficiency. Uh, I believe that's on the BioEd site. I know it was on the full slide deck, but um, Lee can probably address that um, at some point. And then- so the, Sorry, you don't mean, I, I can just jump in now. So everything, um, is in the textbook for sure. So if there's not a video resource, it's definitely spelled out in the textbook. Some of the paper labs aren't necessarily, it's kind of hard to do a video of someone just like using a calculator or whatever, right? Um, if there are some though that you would like to see, uh, that might be something that we can accommodate and post on YouTube. Um, if you could email me, I'll put my email in the chat specifically. Um, then we can kind of consider those and, and add those to the YouTube playlist as well. Yeah. Nice. That's true. It's okay. Thank you. Textbook. And um, I'm going to be doing a little bit about the gel interpretation. Nice. Okay. So this is the sample scenario that you have, and it is for skill one uh, using uh, micropipettes, different kinds for different jobs. And this is activity 2.B from the textbook. That's where they got the scenario from. All right. And so 
you have all of pipettes available to you and you may need to choose the right one. They come in different sizes and um, I don't want this to be a whole micro pipetting seminar because there is the video, <laughs> but um, three different sizes, P1000, P200, P20, and they are for different volume ranges and they have different uh, size tips that go on them. Okay, so you would have to uh, be able to choose the right one and you can tell it depends on which volume you want. It would have to be within the range to use that pipette. All right, and so I see this is covering my screen here. Okay, here we go. Um, so if you wanted to pipette 45 microliters, um, you could kind of test yourself and think about which one you would use. And then I'll go to the next slide. Okay, you would use the P200 because it goes from 20 to 200. And the others, if you tried to crank them up or down too much, you would ruin the pipette, which would not be good. And you would not get the correct volume. If you wanted to pipette, 360 microliters, you can think about which one you would use. And it would be the P1000, okay? Because P200 doesn't go that high and P1000 does. And if you wanted to pipette 18.5, you could think about what you would use and you would use the P20, okay? Oops. Okay. Um, when you use a micro pipette, okay, this is this is the kind that I have. Okay, that's in the picture. You may have a student one. Okay, but either way, this is a student one. Uh, as you practice, you realize that there's just like the resting position. There's a soft stop. Okay, and then there's a you can go a little further. And that's important to figure out where the soft stop is, because if you go further, when you're trying to um, take up liquid, then you'll take up too much volume. And so there's a whole activities in the textbook where you practice that. And you practice that with the most difficult volume, which is two microliters, because that's the smallest volume you can pipette. And so that's the hardest soft stop, stop to feel. And you do all sorts of dots. Uh, and once you get really good at two microliters, you can do anything. All right, that's, the, that's this activity. And we do this uh, in our biotech class. And of course, uh, you pipette these little dots onto parafilm or wax paper. And um, at first, everybody's dots are too big because they're, they're not feeling where the soft stop is. But after a while, they get a lot better at it. And then we do the different sizes. So that's a great uh, activity to help you learn. Okay, the other kind of pipette that you have to know how to use is, you know, cheaper. And, you know, we kind of think, oh, transfer pipette. But you actually have to look at it before you do the lab. Otherwise, you'll waste a lot of time trying to find these annoying little markings, which are just not that obvious. And so what we do at first, when we first use them is mark them with Sharpie so that we can really figure out where's 25, where's 100, because usually it's only the 500 microliter and the one mil that are actually marked. And that marking isn't even that clear. So, um, cheap and and you would think simple but not quite as simple as you think all right and so again you may have biorad ones um i this is not a sales promotion but i have to say after working in research when we're in research we always try to buy biorad because it's the best one and one of the great things about this is that um you get to use the real uh, equipment that you would use in a real lab. And so it works, okay? Um, but you may have other real equipment in your lab, uh, other brands, which is great also. 
but they they may look different okay the tip colors may look different uh, the pipettes may look different i i see another hand yes hi um back on what you were saying about the uh transfer pipettes you were saying yes. that typically only the 500 and the one milliliter are marked yes the line is there but to tell you that it's 500 and to tell you that it's one mil typically most brands only mark those so the line is there but not what volume it is so is there never a line for like um 750 or like 250 or anything like that there is there is a line but it doesn't tell you what volume it is Do you see oh, okay what I mean? but, yeah okay i sorry i wasn't sure if you had like kind of like eyeball it or something or if there actually was a mark no there is actually a line Okay. But you might not necessarily know, oh, that first little line is um, 25, if you hadn't oh, thought okay. about it before. Okay, thank you. Yeah, there you go. And some of the tips uh, may have filters in them, okay, and that would be important for um, PCR. So you need to be prepared and not kind of get put off. These are real lab uh equipment and this is what you would find in a real lab sometimes the, the tips will have filters sometimes the tips will be different colors all right okay um let's see restriction digest this is just showing you pictures of how you're pipetting when you're loading a gel um and you're pipetting when you're doing a protein assay and your pipetting when you're doing an ELISA assay. So really practicing skill one will pay off for all the skills. All right, this is the as promised uh, gel interpretation, which is not got a video, so it's me. All right, so um, the whole basis of this gel interpretation is uh, here's a nice example. When you run an agarose gel, you're running it through a molecular sieve. It's a porous material. And the smaller fragments of DNA go through faster, OK, because they get through that mesh faster. And so the smaller fragments of DNA, see the DNA is going in this direction here. This would be the positive end and the negatively charged um, DNA fragments go towards the positive in your gel. And so the smallest fragments get the furthest away. And um, these up here would be the largest fragments. Now, um, as you can tell, this is a 100 base pair ladder, which means this fragment is 100 base pairs. This fragment is 200 base pairs. This fragment is 300, 400, 500, 600, etc. But they're not equally spaced, even though they're just 100 base pairs difference between them. And that is because um, it's not linear, uh, the distance versus um, the size. It's logarithmic. And so that is why if you want to figure out um, the size of say these bands or a, some bands you might be given in, in the forensics lab um, to, to interpret that data. If you want to figure out the size, you have to plot on semi-log paper, okay? This little, this little link here is just a, a place where I've found where you can print out any kind of graph paper. So if that is useful to you, that is right there. So semi-log means it's a logarithmic on one side and it's just regular graph paper on the other side. And what you would plot on the regular side is the distance. So hence the ruler that you have to bring to the event, metric ruler, and you would measure. How are you going to measure? You would have to, I would, if, if you were allowed to, I would draw a line across, or I would just make sure I was starting at the same kind of place in the well to make sure I'm measuring from the first uh, part. 
And then I would measure and I'd have to be consistent. I'd either be measuring to the middle of the band or to the top of the band, okay, consistently from the well. And I would plot the distance along this x-axis. And then I would plot the um, molecular mass that are in, in base pairs in, along the logarithmic scale. And so you can see it says one, two, three, four, et cetera. Uh, I don't want it to be one because I don't have anything that is just one base pair. So I would make my one, my 100, my two, my 200, my three, my 300, okay? And I should get, because I have accounted for the logarithmic um, function along this side, I should get a straight line. And the straight line will go across this way, okay? Because the further you go, the smaller the fragment is. But it should be roughly a straight line. It might not be perfect, but you would get best fit. Okay, I did it. I printed this out and I did it really fast. And I got a pretty good line. Okay. And, and so then I could read off my sizes. And so what I, I did was I did that. I read my sizes for, so it would measure the distance to this band and then look and see. Um, I, it was 9.7 centimeters on this, on this giant piece of paper. And so that corresponded to 780 from my graph. So like nine was 780 on my line. And so that, and then I looked and said, does that make sense? And it's, and it did make sense because it went a little further than my 800. So I was on the right track. On the next slide, it shows you, this is a nice table. And this, again, this is a lab you do in, from the textbook. And uh, it's, a, it's a forensics lab where you're interpreting uh, the data, the band, um, and actually the gel is, is, how do I go back? Here we go. I believe it comes from this gel. And so you are measuring the sizes of the bands and you're comparing crime scene and sub suspect DNA samples. And then you can determine whether they are the same size using your graph. So your graph is, is your standard curve for that gel. And they, so you would be given in this event, you'd be given a table to fill out and you'd be given some semi-log paper and you would make your graph and you'd use your graph to fill in the data. And you would obviously, you would have a size standard on there to make the graph in the, in the first place. Abby? Um, yeah. A good question in the chat. If there are two lines in one sample, like get, scroll back to the. Oh, yeah, um, sure. Uh, let's see. Yes. Okay, right here. So those wells have three bands, right? So um, yes. the Ruby asks if there are two lines or more, right, in one sample, which yes. one should we use, the longer or shorter? So if you could just. Um, in so, the sample? Yeah. So I think, oh, I think there's some confusion about creating the standard curve versus using the standard curve to okay. determine, right? Does that make sense? Yes. So um, one of these should be your M for marker, is that right? That's right. And so this is the one you would use, you would be given the sizes of these bands. And so you would know what to plot on your Y axis for your semi-log paper. So to make your, your line to begin with, you would measure from the well, to each of these bands and plot that, and then use that straight line that you've made with, to go ahead and measure each of these bands. These are the, the unknowns and um, use your graph to figure out the size of the un unknowns. Sorry about that. Yes, you, you need to understand that. So these you'd be given the sizes and these you would figure out the sizes from your graph. Hey, Abby, can I jump in on this? Yes. 
So one of the things that I teach my students when we're doing this lab is that in any forensics case in court, you can't just have qualitative data. Because if we look at the crime scene, which is C, and then we look at S3, which is the, set, or the, the third suspect, visibly we can see a match. Mm -hmm. But in court, you have to numerically, quantitatively show that those bands are the same size. And so that's why we do the graphing. Excellent, yes. So the why, so we're not just doing it and saying we could do it, but the, the why, so important. I think I have I've, a question. Yes. Um, so will it always be printed paper when they give it to us? And if a band is like a really big, do we like count it as two bands? If a band is really big, do you see one that you might want to count as two bands? On um, there? The first one for marker, it's a, it looks like there's two, I think. Like this guy right here? Yeah. Um, you see in the tails, Abby. Oh, the, oh, I see. Okay, so some bands will be thicker than others. I believe that this is just one band, but there's more DNA there because it's a larger mo molecule. And so you, this is where you have to decide your technique. Do you go for the middle of the band or do you go for the upper edge? But whatever you do, you have to be consistent. Okay, thank that's you. A, that's a very good question. I have a question too. In the marker there, is there a, a band way down at the bottom there? A faint one? Like right here? Yes. Oh, my lanta. It looks like it. Well, but because how, otherwise, how do you account for the and S4 don't forget, and S5? You'll be getting, uh, the competitors will be getting a list of the sizes of each of the bands. So it'll make sense. So let's say there's one, two, three, four, five, six. If you can see six clear ones and you're, you've got a question mark about that one at the bottom, but on the table, there's seven sizes. Does that make sense? Then you'll know that bottom faint band is actually indeed a band. Does that kind of make sense? Okay, thank you. Yeah. What if, what if it's, what if they only give you, oh, okay. Then I think I'll get it then, okay. Yeah. It can be yeah. tricky though, you're right. Yep. So, so they might, if it's super faint like that, they might get not give you the size of that one because they might think that you won't see it. But they would have to because there's like S4 and S5 have bands down at that one, so. That's true, yeah, in this particular gel. Yeah, okay. you wouldn't be able to interpret those without that. There's, there's another way when you look at these that you can kind of interpret things and you'll notice it as you start at the top of the gel everything's very dark, but the bands towards the bottom become faint. And part of the reason is the size of that piece of DNA. Mm -hmm. And so let's suppose that on your chart, you're given eight sizes for your marker, but you can only clearly see six. It may not be safe to try and guess where those other bands are. If you can't definitively see them, it's always safer to go with the bands that you can see and make your graph from those. Guessing on other bands can really, really hamstring your graph. Yeah. Excuse me, Abby. I'm Hello? sorry, I couldn't hear that. Hi, um, my name is Alex. Um, when you look at the um, marker lanes, uh, yeah. The marker lanes usually come with what sizes the range come from, uh, what sizes they range from, like you said before. Like yeah. you said that they were from, you know, they were in, they were from 100 to 2,000. Mm -hmm. um, I think one of the things that I found in the past that works best for me um, is to, even though I only have like this one gel that I'm looking at, is to be very careful about where I anticipate the, the marker is going to be even though you see that there is that one faint residual one at the bottom that the person brought up, unless yeah. it's very clear, um, you don't count it. That's sort of one. Um, yeah. The other thing that I've learned is, you know how um, 
Uh, when you look at measuring uh, water in a graduated cylinder and you get the meniscus, uh, yes. how the how the the liquid sort of has that cohesion and it sort of goes up on the side and you measure at the very bottom of the meniscus to measure mm -hmm. how much liquid is in a graduated cylinder. Sure. Um, I've learned to do the same thing when measuring uh, when measuring the D when accounting for the size of the, the DNA. So I basically shoot for um, the bottom of the bottom. The, uh, the bottom of the piece of DNA uh, and not worry about the tail ends on the sides. Okay, yeah, good tip. One thing I wanted to point out too, there's a bunch of good questions here. Um, the marker on this particular gel is not a um, a, a ladder like the the right. so there's there's different markers as well, right? So some this marker looks like it may have come from a digest of a plasmid. The other marker is just little individual fragments of 100, 200, 300, 400, 500. So this one is not supposed to be. Um, you know, there's not going to be an equal spacing or a, a logarithmic equal spacing between these right. just because it's a different kind of marker. So if you're not right. familiar with that, that may be um, just a question that comes up. So, yes, yes. The reason I showed the other one is just to show that relationship. But yeah, most most of the time you won't have a ladder like that. Yes, I see a hand raised. Uh, yeah, that's me. So uh, I wanted to ask, like, where do we start measuring from and where do we end it? And do we like use millimeters or centimeters? Um, I would start from a consistent place. It's usually the well and a consistent part of the well for every every time. And then we had we just had a very good suggestion to go to the bottom of the band. So you might want to do that. And it would depend on the size of the picture that you have. Um, I, I had that big picture. So I did centimeters and millimeters. So fractions of, of centimeters. My, my ruler didn't go beyond millimeters, so. And you're just asked to bring a, a metric ruler. Yeah, and also, um, is a marker always um, the restriction digestion like Hindi um, lambda, I think, what it was? It, it could be lambda, but it wouldn't always be lambda because there's a lot of different markers. It depends on the size range you want to look at of your sample bands. Uh, excuse me, if I can make one more comment. Yep. Uh, again, um, when you look at the lanes, do you see how in lane number um, three, uh, how the band is darker? Um, it's sort of medium in darkness. And then if you look all the way over at band number six, it looks like it is significantly darker. The 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 darkness of the band is going to depend on how much DNA is actually, um, how much DNA has actually been cut with the restriction enzyme in that location. Mm -hmm. So if we compare lanes number six and seven, uh, sample seven has more DNA, um, I'm sorry, uh, sample number, lane number six or sample S4, uh, it has more DNA that is of the particular size when compared to um, lane number seven, which is, which is S5. So while one will be darker than the other, it's just that there's a higher concentration of DNA in that particular lane. Right, right. Because you're getting it from different people, suspects. 
So yes, you may you may well have a different amount loaded, and that would be a normal thing to happen in a lab. So um, you may you probably wanted to have done a concentration before you loaded if it was a real lab. But yeah, that's a good thing for students to be aware of. Abby, there's a question in the chat about um, the rubric saying um, to circle or delineate which suspect sample matched the crime. Um, oh. Where do we circle that? I, I don't know the answer to that, but I would assume <laughs> the um, probably along the, you know, either in this table, if it's, you know, suspect yeah. one, circle suspect one there, or yeah. in the gel, the label at the top of the gel. I don't think that's something that um, is necessarily um, called out or specified. I can, say, though. I yeah. can answer that. Oh, okay. Oh, good, Jamie. When, okay. Yeah. So when we did the training up here, we suggested any place where it makes sense. There you go. <laughs> so in the, you know, in the chart, on the graph, on the photograph, so that the judge knows you know exactly what's going on. Yep. And and I was just thinking you might just have one picture that's kind of laminated or something. I, I don't know. I don't know how it's set up, but you know, you don't want to mark on something that's another competitor <laughs> has to use. So I think table would be pretty safe. Everyone would understand. Um, I got a private message, but I just wanted to address it with the group because I think it's a good one. Um, for the state competitions, how important was studying the information in the recommended books? Um, so the written test will have, pull information from those sources. So uh, fairly important, right? So they would need to have, um, that's where kind of the science concepts are going to come into play. Um, so hopefully that helps. And in a lot of cases, if you don't get a certain score round one, you don't go on to round two. So, yeah. And there's a hand up. Victoria. No. Um, okay. I want to know if this DNA hell interpretation is in groups or is individual? It's individual. This whole thing is individual. Good question. And uh, someone else asked if there was a written test at the state um, level as well. I does that vary? I I'm gonna. There is so the okay. way you do it is you do your online test in advance, and then depending on your score, um, is whether you have a place at the in-person SLC. So we, we're doing our online testing in February and our in-person is in March. Okay, Kayla. Um, back on what you were saying about the testing, uh, like yours, for example, is in February and then the in-person skills are in March at the state conference. Mm -hmm. Do you know if that is the same for every um, test or for every state? Because um, on the thing, on like the rubric that Hosa gave out, it says that the, like, it was kind of vague about that. And I was just wondering if you knew if that's like for every state I don't, or. I don't know. Okay. Sorry. It's okay. Another hand. Hi, so I was wondering if um, for the multiple choice testing, for round one testing, if our, in our own state it happens online, would we have to do another test in person or would it just be skills testing? Um, I can only tell you what we're doing in Nebraska. 
it's just the online test. Uh, and then at the in-person, it's it's round two. Um, HOSA, official HOSA would be able to tell you, or maybe your state advisor would be able to tell you that. I, I, it seems, if I was just going on, I, I don't want to tell you the wrong thing, but it seems like you're doing round one twice otherwise. Oh yeah, okay, thank you. Yeah. One thing, we've only got a couple more minutes, and one thing I wanted to bring up, um, so my, sorry, I've got the sun blinding me, but um, my name is Lee Brown, and I am a curriculum and training specialist with BioRad. I know some of the advisors have been interested in doing trainings. Um, if you are interested in coordinating a um, state or region level training, I know it's different for every state, um, for your advisors in particular, uh, so they could come back and disseminate that information to their students. Um, then please contact me. I'm going to put my email into the chat right now and I will get you, uh, there's, th there's three of me, so I'll get you to the right uh, one for your area and we'll plan on setting up some of these trainings either virtually or in person, depending on, um, you know, availability. We'll also plan on having more um, uh, focused webinars if that's something that you all would like to see. So that kind of feedback will happen, um, hopefully through a survey that you'll get. And, uh, but otherwise, please feel free to email me, you know, in advance of that if you'd like, and I can help uh, help everyone get trained and um, ready ready for the competition. And just, just to rehash, the recording and the slides will be sent out to everyone uh, who I think has registered for the meeting. So you're good. Um, hi, I have a question. So in the bacterial transformation skills um, skill, uh, step 14 and 15 are repeated, um, but like fit, it doesn't make sense to repeat it again. So like, would we do it or not do it? Because um, my local HOSA, like uh, people have said that we had to do it even though it doesn't make sense. What is that? Let me see. <laughs> the bacterial transformation um, skill six? Yeah, step okay. uh, 14 and 15. Okay, remove the removed tubes from ice and pipetted LB into each tube using a new pipette tip. Uh, dispose into biohazard. That uh, looks like it could be a typo. So let me let me I'll consult with uh, Hosa and we will we will update it if needed. So I thanks for bringing that to my attention though. I didn't I did not see that until just now. Me neither. <laughs> All right, I think we're at time. I have a quick, quick question. Um, I, I tell you what, before, I'm, let's um, just so we're uh, respectful of everyone's time, we are done here. So thank you so much to Abby. Abby and I, I think Abby, at least I can, I know Jamie probably can as well, can hang out here and answer a few more questions. But if you are ready to go, please uh, feel free to leave. And thank you so much for attending. Yeah. Do you want to do it for next week? Hey Lee. Okay. Yes. Um, at HOSA, are all the equipment from BioRad or is it like the MicroPipettes? It it can be from anyone. Okay. Yep. It can be I from anyone. Sponsoring that. So oh. just just like in a real lab, they might come across whatever they've practiced on in, in school, or they might not. So um, it just depends on the state. And um, yeah. Yeah. So. So it might, I think it would probably be good a good idea to um, show students what different brands of pipettes look like. There aren't a ton, there's not, there's not gonna be any pipette that's drastically different from any other pipette, right? They all kind of do the same thing. You adjust it with the knob at the top, you have the soft stop and the hard stop, you have a tip, all of those basics are the same. It's kind of like driving a car. Or riding a bike, maybe that's a little bit easier. So, um, but they might want to just have, be familiar with um, different, different what different brands look like. Yeah. 
And that was that was the purpose of of this slide, because even it, it depends on what uh, whoever's hosting it, what they happen to have. Um, just to clarify something, there was a question about going through all the skills. So this webinar wasn't designed to go through all the skills. That would be a much, much longer webinar. <laughs> yeah. um, we can have more webinars. This was more of just um, Abby kind of giving you an overview of what the um, competitive event is going to be like, how to practice those skills. Um, we focus on just two of those that we've been getting more questions about. So absolutely, we can definitely do more on other skills. Yes. So Lee, could I ask a quick question? Sure. Okay, thank you. Um, so we actually have our area competition next Friday. I'm in Texas. And so um, we were, I'm practicing with my two competitors and we were wondering about, you know, it's a pretty specific question, but like the, when it has an incubation time for let's say two minutes, are they gonna be expected to do a timer for two minutes or do they just need to verbally say, I would incubate this for two minutes? So I, most of them, I think we designed it where it specifically calls out that they can verbalize it. So um, the ELISA, I think, is probably the one that you're talking about, though. Yeah, because we practiced those, that one yesterday. So, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, those incubations, to my knowledge, and I want to confirm this, so please email me back, or if you can shoot me an email. Okay. But to my knowledge, I think that they're actually supposed to do it, because otherwise the test won't happen, won't right? The like, they won't change. get results. Okay. Yeah, that's one of the ones where there's actually a result at the end, and um that one is like, it's a little bit like, ooh, 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 you know, it's getting through it, but it does work great with two minute incubation. So um, yeah, just have them have their, their timers ready to go, or we might have a timer there. I, I can't remember on that one. If there's yeah, that was the thing. That was more part of my question, because it didn't have a timer as one of the required pieces of equipment that we need to bring. So I'm assuming you'll have, they'll have timers. That, that yes, have yes. Okay, perfect. Yep, absolutely. Okay. okay, great. Thank you so much. If I could, I can add something about the time that you might want to consider. Um, having done all of the skills in a training, the timing is tight. You have to have your poop in a group and be ready to go. Or you are not going to be able to get it done in the time allowed. Okay. Yeah, so and that's, Thank that's you. one of the way we can tease out, right? Because some of these everyone will do a great job on, right? They're all gonna be like, just all up at the top. And so that's one of the ways that we can tease out um, those top few. Uh, Kayla, you had a question. Um, yes, it's about the uh, materials needed. So a lot of them are requiring, um, or like part of like the steps when you first begin are all about like donning like uh, proper PPE. Mm -hmm. um, I was looking over the uh, like must provide thing. It, we would never need like surgical gloves, right? It's specifically just non-latex. I don't believe, oh, let me look on here. I don't know off the top of my head. I might have to says, answer that in a letter email or someone else knows. It says uh, to bring disposable non-latex gloves. So just your lab gloves, you know? Okay, because I competed in the biomedical science event last year. Mm -hmm. um and like that one required you to bring like surgical gloves as well which I wasn't aware of until the night before the event um so well, I just wanted to make sure that I wouldn't be caught off guard again right right and I'm just reading the the guidelines and what you know competitors must provide mm -hmm. and they they I mean they don't they just say disposable non-latex gloves okay. So. okay thank you yeah I know those last minute dashes, like, oh no, I need a coverall. <laughs> it was quite entertaining oh, last year. <laughs> oh dear. It was quite entertaining last year. A couple of my um a couple of my other friends who were competing in a different event, we had to run out to a eleven thirty um at night run to Walmart to get scrubs. So yes. oh, no. <laughs> yeah. I have a question for the experts. Um, when the competitors have to draw the graph on the semi-log paper, if it's not, a, do they connect the dots or do they draw a best fit line? It's if it's not fit. perfectly straight when they graph it. Yeah, best fit. Yeah. Mine wasn't perfect. Mm -hmm. I did best fit. 
And um, just to reiterate that, there is a good explanation of that in the textbook under chapter four. So that's a, a good practice, practice one for them. Okay, thank you. Absolutely. Uh, Don V. Hi, so back to the gel electrophoresis. I was wondering when we're determining the um, the location relative for each sample relative to where the marker is, would we draw like a diagonal line across the graph or would we draw lines across like the x-axis determining the location? Um, let me just show you real quickly. I'm going to share my screen okay. and um, I think this might help. So something like this. Can you see how that looks? Um, oh. Oh. Uh. Sorry, I don't know if it's my sound or yours. I'm having trouble hearing. Hey, Lee, I think I can kind of, I know what she's asking. She's okay, trying to figure ahead. out where do I come in and hit the, hit the line of best fit. And the answer is, is that you're going to come in from the bottom yes. because that's what you know. Oh, so you'll sorry, come yeah. in from the distance where the band traveled and you're going to take that you're going to run up at your line of best fit and then go across to the size of your given fragment and there are if i know we don't have a youtube video on here but there's probably a hundred of them on here on how to do this so um that'll that should help too i can maybe look and see if there's a good one that kind of encapsulates that though Okay, thank you so much. Absolutely. And Madeline. Uh, hi, I had a question. I think I asked it in the chat as well. I don't see that it got replied to though. Yeah. I had a question about um, studying without using the textbook as in my my school is like the largest HOSA chapter in the state and we can't really afford to have the textbook for our event uh like even even like the pdf we me and the other me and the one other person in in this event at our school determined it not worth it to get the pdf or just how much it was and for how little time we'd have we'd have it to use it. So I was just wondering if you had any tips on studying with and preparing for the multiple choice test uh, without the P without the without the textbook. So there are a lot of online resources. I don't have them vetted for what's covered on the HOSA exam. Um, there are a ton of, <clears throat> excuse me, a ton of resources for just learning general biotechnology skills, mm -hmm. right? And understanding those concepts, biology skills behind them that kind of thing um, that might help. I know that the textbook, like the older version of the textbook is sometimes available on textbook reseller sites. So um, I don't know, eBay is not the best, but there's multitude of textbook resellers. And this is a textbook that uh, is often used in colleges as well. So they'll be reselling it. So that might be a good option. The white one is the one that's the older version. Uh, the, the new one is a black cover. So. Hopefully that helps. All right. Um, I think, okay, Aishwarya, I, I'm yeah. sorry if I didn't get that name right. Okay. You got it. Um, oh, so, yeah, so I had a question about like how, um, so if we do the steps, um, does it have to be in the order? Like for one of them, you had to add, um, for the brad for protein quantitation, you had to add one milliliter of the reagent to all 10 cuvettes. And then the next step is mixing. So could we like combine those two steps or do we have to do it exactly like it says in the guidelines? I would, I would do, do them exactly like the guidelines tell you. Not necessarily because you would get points off if you do them out of order, which is always a possibility, but with the time constraints that have been worked into this, if you do it in the order they tell you, you will get the result that you need. And I think that's the crucial piece here. And also remember the judges are um, working off that rubric. And so they're going to be following that down, right? 
So if you make their life as possible for them, that'll help. Okay, thank um, you. I think we have time for just one more question. And don't forget, you can always contact me or talk to your host advisor and they can contact me. Um, and again, I'm gonna put my name in the chat. So Dondi, if you have a question. Hi, um, so for the textbook, would it be okay if we had the first edition and not the latest edition? Would it cover the same information? It should be fine. The only thing that's been updated um, is CRISPR, which we're not doing, and a few other higher level labs. So the first edition of the textbook should be fine. I just okay, don't know if there's page no. reference numbers, you might have to adjust, right? So that kind of thing. Kind of thing. Um, All right, thank you so much. Sure. All right, well, thank you. Um, and I hope this was helpful. And thank you, Abby, for presenting and Jamie for jumping in with questions. Um, I am not a HOSA expert, so I, this is new to me as well. Uh, so I am, I am a, a, a biotech lab expert, but um, so I will help however I can. And I'm, like I said, happy to do trainings. Um, just contact me and we will, uh, you know, plan that for um, the spring. Thanks all. Thank you. <laughs> I hope we have a whole class of kids over there. I love it. I know. That's awesome. <laughs> All disappearing. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, I just have one more question. If you oh want. sure, sure. Um, okay, so um, I think um, so. I'm in Texas, and we're having our um, second round like tomorrow. Mm -hmm. um, and I was just wondering if like, so I don't have access to a textbook. Is there like anything that you'd suggest that I do last minute just to make sure I'm fully ready? Um, I would say that's a tough one. Abby, Jamie, you have any ideas for that? For the written test? Mm -hmm. uh, for the second part, the skills. Oh, I see. Um, the skills just watch the video. Do you have the HOSA playlist? Yes. That's what I would do. Absolutely. Okay. Yep, yep. And just, just look at your guidelines to know your steps. That helps a lot, the rubric. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. All right. I have a question. I'm sorry. Yeah, no, go ahead. Um, how can I find more information about like the day of the conferences? Like when will be? Um, let's see. I think we're gonna have those conferences on here. It should be on the HOSA website. Um, and I'll put the link in here for you in the chat. So there's that. There you go. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Uh, Dombi, did you have one last question? Oh no, sorry, my hand was still raised. No, we're, I do that all the time. All right then, I think we're I think we're all done. So I'm gonna end it now. Thanks so much, everyone. May I have a good you? afternoon. You don't mind? Oh yeah, go ahead. So I had unfortunately had to attend the meeting a bit later. I see that the meeting is being recorded. Will this be sent out or the slide? Absolutely, we'll send this out and the slide deck. Uh, will that come in my email account or like in the link? I'm not sure how. Um, it should go out to your email account. I don't know. Let's see if do we have Bobby. It will. It will. Definitely go out to everyone who registered. So if you register with your email account, should, should you should get a link in there. Okay. And okay. that would include all of the basic review slides of the meeting, right? Yes. Everything that we talked about and the recording. Okay. Thank you very much. You're so welcome.
Hi, I'm um, sorry. I just want to no. know if I can contact um, like both of you if I have any questions because I don't have that many um, biotechnology, like they don't, nobody in my school is that experienced with this. Sure. Um, so I gave you my email address. You're welcome to just shoot me an email and then I can pass it along to Abby and, or Jamie. Okay. If you'd like. Thank you. Yeah, Thank welcome. you. Have a nice day. You too. You. Okay. Thanks, everyone. Okay. Is the Mercosur more qualified for this? That I don't know. Um, if you could email info at hosa.org, is that right? They should be able to tell you. Okay, sorry, because I am currently a 11th grader here in Mercosur Moore High School. Okay. I just got an email, so I just hop on it. <laughs> I was listening. Okay, um, you'll get the whole recording and all the slides and everything, so you'll be all set. Oh, also, I'd like to share, um, we have a... a You're cutting out a bit, I can't hear you, sorry. If you want to um, here in our school, is it the, the connection is just real bad. I tell you what, I'm gonna put my email here, and if anyone has any other questions, I'm gonna hop off now. Oh, okay, sorry, I'm um, a bit loud. If you can just shoot me an email, that would be great. All right, and then I can get you the information you need. So I just put it into the chat. Can you your email, please. It's in the chat. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. All right. Any other questions? You guys just email me. You have my email now. And I am going to end the meeting. So thanks so much. Bye-bye.